going to be attempting to answer your most challenging questions about catamaran and sailing and other things. Um, if you're watching this and it's not Wednesday um, at three o'clock Greek time, whatever that means to you, um, that means that this will have been pre-recorded. So if you comment, I won't be able to respond immediately, but I will respond by typing and then I will uh, answer your question verbally in the following week's Q&A, just so that everybody is reading off the same page. Yes, that's right, I'm Joe um, from Wild Wind Sailing Holidays and Joyrider TV back, uh, coming to you from Vasiliki on the Greek island of Lefkus, where you can see we've got a lovely sunny day. Hello, Germans fan, first one in. Great to have you on board. Just make sure all of the chat is visible. Yes, it is. Um, so once again, I have got some preloaded questions that we could start working through immediately. Hi, Oscar, nice to have you with us. Hello, Martin. Aha, Martin. Martin is, of course, the purveyor of the finest carbon fiber you're going to find this side of Kentucky. Um, Hello, Quinty. Great to have you on board. Uh, Quinty is the finest purveyor of micro foundries this side of uh, Bogner Regis. Um, hello, Kurosh. Not great to have you on board. Hello, Ewan. It's half term. You can be here. Yes, you can. Hi, Fred. Yeah, Martin's carbon fittings, absolutely beautifully handmade carbon fittings. He's doing some kits for tornadoes, for the rudder systems. As soon as I've dug my rudders out for my tornado, we're gonna be making a video on fitting these beautiful new carbon parts to the tornado rudder system. As well as that, Martin's making some very, very, very high-end carbon tiller extensions, which um, uh, we're gonna be reviewing in due course as well as they arrive. They're currently in Switzerland. If, ever, any, if anybody happens to be driving from um, Switzerland to Greece um, at any time soon, do get in touch. Uh, that would be very nice. All right, who else have we got arrived? Uh, hello, Robin. Great to have you on board. Hi, Timon. Hi, Pablo in France. That'd uh, be Kush in Michigan, I believe. Hello, Victor. Oscar, you're welcome. I hope that helps. Um, Oscar was asking about some <clears throat> spinnaker shoot measurements for a Hobie 20. Um, I don't actually have a Hobie 20 here. So I measured the spinnaker shoots from an F-18 and from a Tornado. And you'd, you'd assume that the, um, the, the, 20, the Hobie 20 fits somewhere in between. Oh, I think that's... Uh... <laughs> oh, my goodness. Hi, Chris. Looking forward to the, to the show. Yes, and it is a show that we've got panning out in front. There's a lot of people here already. Hi, Yannick. Uh, great to have you on board. And we've got John Bishop from uh, John Bishop Skateboarding. Um, yes, you can. Bamboo is the only way to go on the tillers. Yeah, interesting, uh, interesting comment there. But um, for, for a time, uh, while we were in our very much pikey stage here at Wildwind, we were, um, and there was budget cuts galore, uh, we did actually start harvesting bamboo and using that as tiller extensions, which is nothing short of downright dangerous because um, if you know about bamboo, you'll know when you snap a bit of bamboo, it's got some absolutely um, devastating killing device that it becomes when it's in two pieces. So snap bamboo, no fun. Very cheap tiller extension, yes, as long as you're not gonna break it. Good old days. Um, incidentally, if anybody is looking at improving their skateboarding skills 
and enjoy this style of video that I make. Uh, then John Bishop there is making tutorial videos for skateboarding manoeuvres where he's breaking down skateboarding manoeuvres and making them so they are possible to do. And he's doing it in the time that he's actually learning the manoeuvres himself. So you can watch him fall off quite a lot as well. Um, there you go. Well worth a look. Um, hi, Eustace, it's great to have you on board. When Giles says boom, does that mean we've got the tappy tappy screen noise? Again, if we can, I could take this microphone off my hat. Because um, once again, difficulty with the microphone, perhaps. Kurosh says, did you try making a longer one to see if your writing pole would work? No, um, by the time I'd made the Mark II writing pole, that was when we were putting all the boats away. So um, the Mark III, which will be a completely different design, will be coming in the summer of 2021. And um, it will be successful because I've watched someone else's video, which um, shows one that works and I'm just going to copy it. I think sometimes that is what you have to do. All right. German's fan. I just started removing the paint from my Hobie 16 today. I already regret to have started it. Oh, my goodness. Yes, that is the sort of job that once, once you're committed to it, that's it. You're going all the way, baby. And perhaps looking at pictures of how your boat looked before. Maybe you liked that kind of, um, what do they call it? In um, American cars, I believe it's called the rat look, where you've got a really old looking car that goes like a rocket, um, which is of course what a dirty looking Hobie 16 is gonna do for you. Um, but yeah, 10 out of 10 for commitment there, and you've now just got to see it through. Good luck on your onward journey there. And um, we look forward to seeing the end results, of course, on Show Us Your Cat. Oh, good morning, Pierre. Great to have Canada on board. Okay, Oscar says, would it be a big problem if I put a chute from a tornado on my 20, even if it was a little bit big? Um, no, I don't think it would be a massive problem. The issue would be if the chute opening um, on... If it was just the chute, then it shouldn't be a problem because what you can actually do, if the soft part of the chute is too long, you can um, actually have it so the chute ends underneath the trampoline. Normally, a spinnaker chute on a boat would finish just next to the front beam, but you could have it so it ended underneath the trampoline, not necessarily with the spinnaker going in that far, the one thing you do have to look out for with the mounting of the spinnaker chute is that the opening isn't too far forwards because um, just ready for picture number one of the day. All right, so spinnaker chute. Um, there is our cutting edge hull shape. There's the mast. There is the spinnaker. Sh this is the spinnaker pole. Is everybody with me? I'll draw in the mainsail. We've got some battens. All right. So if the spinnaker chute is too far forwards, so if we were to put that here, then what that would mean is the amount of friction from the halyard around this part of the chute, so that would come back like that, there's going to be an enormous amount of friction just there. So what we're trying to do is put the spinnaker chute back further so that that will reduce this amount of friction when um, hoisting or dropping your spinnaker because, of course, the retrieval line would be going around that angle um, as well when you come to drop the spinnaker. Um, also, if your spinnaker shoots really far forwards, I believe you'll get more windage as well um, because you've got a load of stuff out here. Whereas if your spinnaker chute is back here, kind of where it should be, 
this drawing is not to scale, by the way, um, then all of your windage is in one space, which surely is more efficient than having it in a number of different places on the boat. Uh, there we go. But yes, you could, by all means, um, put a tornado spinnaker shoot on your 20, I think. All right, scrolling back. Pardon me. Um, Eustace says, I just want to sail a 420. It's a good choice. Um, very nice. Uh, Victor says, what do you think about putting a Jenica on a Dart 18? Yes, um, it's, uh, we've, we've actually been here before. We were talking about fitting spinnakers to boats, which were originally designed without spinnakers, such as the Dart 18, the Hobie 16, and uh, fresh in from Canada, the Prindle 15. Um, I would say the best reason for fitting a spinnaker like that to a boat which wasn't designed with it is if you're wanting to do some real distance sailing. Um, so if you're wanting to cover a lot more ground downwind, then that is the reason to do it. When it gets windy, like uh, let's call it trape good solid trapezing conditions, yes, a spinnaker will add quite a lot more sparkle on the downwind points of sail, um, but it's not completely necessary because the boat was designed without one. But if you really want to get downwind fast, uh, doubling your sail area is of course going to help. But um, if you're looking to be racing, then it's gonna affect your yardstick, your handicap number. So keep that in mind. And on the Dart 18, I did sail a Dart 18 with a spinnaker. And what we noticed quite a lot is it the spinnaker, because the Dart 18 is quite a minimalist design, um, the spinnaker kit adds quite a lot of windage to the rig. So um, you do really feel a bit of drag on the upwind point of sail from the windage on the spinnaker kit. So those are the considerations. But I believe there is a factory spinnaker kit available for the Dart 18 from the factory. So um, it's all done for you if you want to do it. There we go. All right. Okay, Fred says, I noticed that in one of your episodes, you removed the mast hinge on a Hobie 16 after the mast was up. I've always left it on. Seems, based on a bit of bending, that it should come off correct. Yes, absolutely correct, because what the mast hinge will do if you don't take it off is it will prevent the mast from rotating. And it's essential that the mast is able to rotate. Um, you could possibly leave the lower part of the mast hinge attached so it's always there. But if you're just using the pins like we've got on our one here, then definitely better to take it off. And in fact, on any type of boat where there's some sort of pin or a stick or uh, with the Dart 18, we used to use a screwdriver that was locking the mast to the mast base for hoisting, then we always take it out afterwards. Because um, on the, like the Hobie Tiger, um, where there's a small bolt that goes through behind the ball, much better to take that bolt out because it, it doesn't actually restrict anything when you're sailing, but in the heaven forbid, uh, event of your mast falling down, um, what's going to happen is the mast isn't going to be able to jump off the ball and you're actually going to knacker your mast ball as well if the mast comes down. Better that the mast can just come off in that situation. Uh, so that's what I think. Good question. Oh, was there a little follow-up there? I pulled the pin so it would ro rotate, but it bent 
anyway. Yeah, I think it would prob because it's gonna be kind of in the way of where the mast is rotating and perhaps if it's not in the right position, when you let the rig tension off, it's gonna get fouled there as well. Much better just to take it off and put, if you've got um, some other, let's say, equipment that you use when you're dropping or raising the mast, keep it with all that lot so that then it's easily accessible. But also you don't wanna risk losing it when you're out sailing because, um, because you don't. There you go. All right, so just to let you know, if you're just tuning in or watching later, I will be indexing all of the questions that come in. So it will be in the video description once this video is uploaded later on. Um, and it will say at what times which questions got answered. So if, if your time is limited, um, you can cut through the waffle with, um, by just going to the time when um, the relevant question is answered. But what I would say is um, the fee for you coming in later and watching um, and getting straight to the point is you have to hit the like button if you are going to be skipping lumps of waffle because the people who are here live, they're having to sit through the waffle and uh, that is what they're paying for this experience. Hope everyone's having a lovely time by the way. All right. All right, Fred says, if you have not started a paint job, I would recommend trying buffing and waxing first. It amazed what, amazed me what, I, what it did for my 1974 Hobie. Nice. Uh, Eustace says, where is German? I, I want to sail a 420. You guys could get together. Uh, German's fan says, my Hobie 16 was in the ugliest beige. Mm. When I got it, it would have been the original paint job. If it would have been the original paint job, I would not even mind it being a bit used. Yeah, I can see that uh, ugly beige. It's not a good look. Um, oh, Oscar's, news just in, Oscar's found a cheap tornado shoot. I think it sounds like a good plan. All right, Chris says, I read in a book, cleaning your cat makes it go faster. Do you think, do you think that's necessary or makes any real difference, assuming it has no visible dirt and grime? I think if you've got time, then um, cleaning your boat and polishing it is definitely going to give you a little, you know, some of that, little bit more. Um, so if you've got the time and inclination um, and it's not too cold where you are, yes, go for it. Clean your boat. Um, it is the winter. And if, um, if you've got time on your hands, then why not give your boat a bit of a clean. Just imagine the situation. Um, I'm sure some people are in this situation, but um, perhaps of a cold winter's evening, you could go down to your garage where your boat is, uh, put on some, uh, some light jazz on the radio and get to polishing your hulls. What a lovely evening that would be. Um, all right. I can see... Uh, all right, Stephen. Hello, Stephen. My view is the Hobie 16 doesn't warrant a kite. It's a go-kart of a boat. Yeah, I would actually agree with the 16. Um, but like I said, the, um, the only time I've sailed uh, 16 with a kite was when I was in Mauritius this time last year. And um, we were doing quite a lot of long distance sailaways. And when the wind wasn't kind of double trapezing upwind amount of wind, the spinnaker meant that we could cover massive amounts more distance um, to get to where we wanted to go. Where, um, because you can sail deeper with the spinnaker and get there sooner. So that is the one time when I think it's worthwhile. Oh, hi, Frank. We got Frank in Canada uh, just tuning in. All right, we've got Razorblade64. I love you. 
I love you, you orangutan. Oh, thank you very much. Fred says waffles are great. Okay, Razorblade64 already coming out with some abuse. You want to watch your language there, Mr. Razorblade. Otherwise, you might get banned by YouTube itself. Um, waffles are stinky. Um, all right, yeah. Um, continuing. Uh, Giacomo Carly, hi. Um, where were you born? <laughs> How did you get to Greece? Interesting question. I'm I'm from uh, England, um, uh, from the east coast of England, a town called Felixstowe, famous for container ships. I've been working in Greece now for over 25 years, um, involved heavily, um, exclusively with the sailing at Wild Wind sailing holidays. And um, I got here by basically applying for a job with those guys. And um, I got the job eventually and never looked back because the sailing here is the best I've ever experienced. And I don't actually think it could be any better anywhere else within reason. I'd quite like to go to Tahiti, but um, I think that's gonna be a bit more of a stretch. All right. Kurosh, one option, instead of painting, do, oh, like a vinyl wrap. Yeah, um, well, um, one of our regular viewers, uh, Dave in, uh, from Lake Lanier, Georgia, has done a vinyl wrap on his 16. He's yet to release the pictures of um, that, the results of that vinyl wrap, but hopefully we'll be able to persuade Dave to show us the pictures of the results there and um, to, uh, so we can feature that on Show Us Your Wrap, uh, which would be very nice. Ah, uh -huh. Car Yancomo Carly is from Rimini, Italy. Great town. Uh, obviously, I was there two years ago with Swedish John doing the Hobie, the Hobie, no, sorry, the Tornado Europeans. Uh, what a great place. All right, we've got Jean. Hi, Joe's wondering where you exactly measure the dolphin striker width. Tension, you said it should be between three and a half, four and a half centimetres wider at the back than the front. Okay. All right, I believe those measurements are actually inches. Is that right? Yeah, I think those measurements are actually inches. But let's take a look. It's um, because the Hobie 16 isn't... <clears throat> isn't straight that's why it's inches because the back of the boat is actually a bit where we're going to measure from is actually wider than the front of the boat so at the back of the boat we're going to take the measurements between the center of the rudder pin or if your rudders aren't mounted just a hole where the rudder goes so that is going to be where the back of the boat measurements are going to be taken and then at the front of the boat, we're going to take the measurements uh, in the most obvious place there is from the center of the bolt there. And um, then we're looking for between three and a half and four and a half inches less at the front than we have at the back. Um, so the warnings with the dolphin strike attention while we're here is... If the dolphin striker is too loose, you'll know it's too loose because if you give the bar a wang like that, it'll rattle. If this rattles, it's definitely too loose. If it's tight like this, chances are that it's all right. But if you've got, um, you could measure it just to double check. If the dolphin striker is too loose, the pressure from the mast pushing down is going to be too much. It's not going to be supported and you're going to end up with a crack appearing here and eventually that crack could become more of a open chasm and uh, bad times would be upon you. Then at the other extreme, if your dolphin striker is wound up too tight, then what it could do is bend the beam too much and you can actually get creases happening here 
which could again snap your front beam. So if you've never touched your Dolphin Striker, um, give this a wang. If it doesn't rattle, don't worry about it too much. That would be my advice on that. <laughs> because if something's been fine for maybe the last 20 years or so, um, chances are it's still fine. It's not like it's something that's going to go out uh, necessarily. All right. Ahaha, Yasu Pano. We've got Panos here from Patra. Um, Panos famous for the um, Hobie 16 with 220 kilos on board video. Um, hopefully we'll be seeing you soon here, Pano. Um, all right, Yan Yankomo Carly says, uh, very nice town to live. We're talking about Rimini in a very high quality of life, but not so good for sailing. Often light winds, too many waves when there is wind. Yeah, um, yeah, we did find it was quite a light wind when we went there, but what a nice town. Um, all right, Martin says, the Hobie 16 has got to be the first catamaran sailed for more than 50% of cat sailors, for sure. The older kids still sailing. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I believe the statistic is actually that there are more Hobie 16s in the world than every other type of catamaran put together. Um, that's a lot, I think we could just say. Um, there we go. I don't even know what the second highest uh, number is of catamarans, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was the Hobie 14. Um, in fact, Hobie just nailing it back in the day. All right, Fred says, great advice on the striker. Panos says, waiting for April. Panos is coming in April, nice. All right, we've got Adolfo Diaz, F-18, great to have you on board. In Portugal, great. Um, you sail an F-18, the Algarve, nice. All right, Fred says, would you... I'm sort of... I've got a bit of the old uh, glare on the screen, making it difficult to read the comments. Um, by the way, if you did um, send in a question earlier to be answered, I will get on to it. I'm going to make sure I answer all of the questions, pardon, today. Would you recommend replace the padding on the side rails of the Hobie? What do you recommend? Yeah, um, I when, when I'm replacing the rubber on the sidebars, I would recommend replacing it, but only if it's kind of gone. Um, if you've got bald patches where there is metal showing through, or if the rubber that you have got on your sidebars is like somebody's been polishing it, so it's a really slippery surface, then it is worth replacing. But like with repainting your boat, once you start trying to take the rubber off your sidebars, it can be quite a mission. And um, my usual tool of choice there is the Stanley knife blade, um, because once it's on, it's on. Um, at Wildwind here, when we're replacing the rubber on the sidebars, we buy the stock Hobie Cat they call it neoprene anti-skid um, from Hobie Cat Europe. But um, I, if you're in the States, there's another product called Rail Rug, I believe, uh, which is really, really good. And everybody who uses it absolutely loves it. Um, another material is called Pro Grip, which is a non-textured rubber Um but most importantly is just do a really good job with the glue because there's nothing worse than having the grip peeling off the side of your boat. So really read the instructions on how to use the glue that you've got worth buying good glue because you don't want that stuff peeling off. There we go. All right, John Jean says, I once read about the watermelon squeeze acceleration method. Somebody said you need to set the sails in the right position before the breeze hits. 
Yeah, I've never actually heard of the watermelon squeeze, but yeah, so I can't really comment on that at this time. But yes, you should definitely set the sails in the right position. All right, Adolfo Diaz F18 says, we always have problems with the jib on our F18 Hawk. Yeah, you'd have to be a bit more specific with what problems you have with it. There are obviously a world of problems that you could have with the jib. Uh, Giacomo Carly says, what do you think of the A-class catamaran? I think it's an absolute Bobby Dazzler. And if um, somebody just said, okay, Joe, I'd like to buy you a boat, what would you like? I would like a totally up-to-date, very modern uh, front of the fleet A-class because I think the A-class catamaran is the pinnacle of small catamaran sailing for single-handed race course. You get the biggest names in catamaran sailing, um, sailing the A-class in the racing. And um, now they've been foiling now for years, but oh my goodness gracious me, that's a fast boat. And um, it mu I've never actually sailed one, but I would absolutely love to and go and do some events and that. So I'd say yes, A-class, yes. Downside for the A-Class is it is so lightweight, it does make it rather fragile. So if you're sailing from a beach, which um, has some features, which could put a hole in a boat, then uh, the A-Class is gonna be more vulnerable than certain others. Okay, John says, then your boat gets an acceleration as if you squeeze a watermelon squeed seed between your fingers, do you agree? Yeah, definitely. If you've got your sails in the right place, what you're getting, all right, let's uh, illustrate this comment uh, using a, a board of illustrations. Um, this will be the green part of the watermelon. So we've got our sails. Is that, can you actually see that? Um, no, because I've got this in the wrong place. Um, the sails are kind of pulling that way or wherever the center of effort is on the sail, the, uh, the sails are pulling perpendicular to the center of effort. So let's, I'll draw this over here. So the center of effort would be where the deepest part of the sail is, which let's say it's here. So the pull from the sail would be going this way. Then, so if we're talking about the squeezing of the pip between the fingers and the pip shoots forwards, I believe that's what we're talking about. So that is pulling that way. And then we've got our hull. This is our hull, the hull of our boat. Here, our hull will have some method of leeway prevention. So that might be the asymmetric hull of a Hobie 16 or a Prindle. It might be a skeg hull like on a Dart 18, or it might be a centerboard or a daggerboard. Um, then that effect, because it's getting pushed that way, so this is pushing the whole boat that way, but the pressure on the centerboard is the opposite direction. All right, hold on. Just gonna tidy up a bit. The pressure is the opposite direction, which the end result means that the hull gets shot forwards like the seed or pip of the watermelon. So yes, agreed. There we go. We're covering it all today. Um, Kurosh says, how would you choose sail size and material? For example, for my A-clap, there are three different surface areas offered. Is it based on sailor weight or is it for speed and performance? Um, yeah, I'm not entirely sure, actually. I haven't looked at the class rules for the A-class, but um, I would say it's probably more to do with the wind strength that you're likely to be sailing in, but also the sailor weight 
comes into it. So I would say if perhaps you are, let's say, more than 85 kilos, you should go for the biggest one. Um, and then if you are um, lighter, maybe down to about 70, 75, go for the middle one. If you're less than 75 kilos, go for the smallest one, I would say. All right. Lovely. Stephen says, use two-part contact adhesive when he replaced the rubber strips on his Hobie. Tapes the beams as a guide. 3M sell a lemon-based cleaner. Let's keep that cleaner lemon-based. Great idea. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Oscar, how big should the opening be of the shoot for my 20? I don't have that information to hand, but if you refer back to the photographs that I sent, um, with the measurements, you'll see where the bolt rope in the chute was at the front and the back, but that is a good size. Uh, you want it to be pretty big. And those are from Hobie shoots, even though one of them is a tornado shoot, but we've actually used the plastic part of a Hobie shoot and then custom made the actual soft part. But the, the Hobie shoots are really good because they're a good size and uh, means that even a big spinnaker could go in and out nicely. Okay. All right, I'm just gonna um, have a look at our first preloaded question, which is from Tim in Florida. He says, when you have to sail straight downwind, like through a, a dredged channel, um, should you, so if you're sailing straight downwind, should you let your jib luff behind the mainsail or should you set the jib out on the other side? Now that is a practice that we call goose swinging. Um, I say definitely goose swing that bad boy because otherwise your jib is doing nothing. Um, so let's just illustrate this. Here we go. So. Okay, I'm going to town with this uh, illustration. So if the wind is coming from straight behind, mainsail out to the side, that is quite an exaggeration who would ever be able to get their mainsail out that far. If the jib is sat here, then it's not actually gonna be receiving any wind and it won't be um, adding to the performance of the boat. It won't be making you go any faster. Um, however, if we put that, let's get rid of him, out the other side, oh my goodness. Now we are cooking on gas. This is goose swinging. I believe in some countries they call it um, something like doing the butterfly. Mm. Um, but yeah, definitely get the jib the other side. That's nice. There we go. That was a great question. All right, next preloaded question just coming in. We've got Christopher. Uh, I don't know where Christopher is, but um, he says, why? No foot straps on the Hobie 16. It's a very good question. The first answer is going to be because of safety. Um, maybe this one's a little bit loose, but let's start off with it anyway. Because the 16, as you may be aware, is quite prone to the occasional pitch pole. Um, if your foot is locked in to a foot strap and you pitch pole and you can't get out, then um, let's just say that it could be painful or worse. So that's the first one is the potential for a hospital visit if your foot is locked into a foot strap. Um, I know on the DAR 18, they put, rather than foot straps, they put toe loops, which are made out of like, um, 
sort of like a thin hose pipe. So in the worst case scenario, if you did go for a really heavy pitch pole and you're in the tow loop, the tow loop will break. So you get released um, out of uh, harm's way. But the other reason why you wouldn't want, well, why we don't fit toe straps or foot straps to our Hobie 16s is because this part of the boat here, when it's on the leeward side or the leeward side, um, this part of the boat is getting water covering it a fair amount of the time when it's windy. So if you've got a foot strap on there, your foot strap is just gonna be getting belted by the water. It's gonna create drag, slow you down, and um, it'll probably uh, get damaged over time as well with that much water pressure hitting it. So for those reasons, uh, personally, that's why I don't use uh, foot straps on the 16, but the solution that I engage is let's assume my hand is my foot. I actually use the tiller arm as kind of like a strap for a bit of security. So when I'm back in the Joyrider TV, giving it the beans and let's have some juice position, I'll put my foot under the tiller arm and hook the toes under the tiller arm to get a little bit of security there if things start getting a little bit fruity. Um, but that's rather than putting an actual foot strap on the boat. And looking at it as well, if you've got a foot strap here, you could get the tiller arm um, every time you tack or jibe or steer the boat, the tiller arm could be hitting the foot strap as well. So there's a number of reasons why I'm not into it, but that's not to say that you shouldn't, but I don't. Thanks for the question there. Christopher, let's see if we've got anything else in the live. Okay, Oscar says, is it the black one? Okay, um, so just in reply to Oscar here about these spinnaker shoots, um, both of the spinnaker shoots that I sent pictures of, um, are at, they actually fit on the same plastic part, so the opening would be exactly the same on both of them. All right. All right, so. Oh, E1K helping Oscar out there can do some actual measurements. Uh, Giacomo Carli says, could you please repeat, how do you call the butterfly sales position? The goose wing, like the wings of a goose. That is a very much English term. Um, okay, we've got um, Willem. Nice to have you on board, Willem. Thanks for tuning in. Goose wing versus ideal angle for best VMG. Yeah, this is, um, yeah, we've talked about this before, but um, I'd say if the wind was mega light and you're sailing a boat, which um, like a Hobie 16, or probably most boats, I'd say, if the wind is really, really, really light, then sometimes you'll get a bit more, you'll get to where you're going quicker by sailing straight downwind than going for the angles. Things to consider are, firstly, if there's more wind um, somewhere, if there's ever more wind, pardon me, go for the extra wind, that will certainly get you there quicker. Um, or if there's a current, try to, if the current's with you, try to get into the stronger current. If it's against you, get out of the stronger current. Um, other obstacles, such as other boats, you want to make sure that you are staying out of dirty wind. And um, But it's worth experimenting with. If you can go sailing with somebody else who's got the same sort of boat as you and who are up for doing a bit of two-boat experimentation, let's call it, then perhaps pick a fixed downwind mark. One of you sail straight downwind, one of you do the angles, and do a bit of experimentation. I'm certainly gonna be getting dug into that uh, in the upcoming season because it has 
been quite an interesting point that we've been talking about during these sessions. Okay. Okay, and we have got uh, Dave, uh, Hobie 16 Amateur Hour on board. And it, this is the very same Dave who has vinyl wrapped his 16. So if everybody could put in the comments right now, go on, Dave, show us your 16 on Show Us Your Cat. I'm sure Dave won't be able to, he'll crack under the pressure and he will have to show everybody his vinyl wrapped 16. Okay, Jean says, on my lake is a catamaran motorboat going max 19 knots and I try to keep, keep it in my water spray. How can I keep it there? Oh, hello. On my lake is a catamaran motorboat. Um, no, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not getting you there, Jean. You'll have to rephrase your question. Um, all right, we've got Russell on board. Oh, it's been a while, Russell. Hope you're doing well. It's Russell who's got the Viper that was featured in an episode of Show Us Your Cat. Um, Russell's just signed up for all of the regattas in 2021. Waiting for 10 degrees more so you can go out and practice. Good on you. Show us your wrap. Yeah, there you go. There you go, Dave. You, the peer pressure is starting to come in. All right, so I'm just going to go into the next preloaded question, which is from James, who's asked about landing and beaching strategies. Uh, the, he says, problems I'm having is slowing the boat down enough and getting the boat oriented into the wind to take the sails down. The main beach I sail on is a mix of sand and gravel, so he's very careful not to drag his boat up the beach. All right, so here we go, back to the board. So we're talking about approaching the beach and your best way to land. All right, so let's start off by drawing the beach. I think that's a good place to start. Where is this? Okay, it's over here. All right, so how does the beach look? It's kind of like this. Right, there's the beach. And now we could have caught, let's say that we've got um, three main wind directions we could have in relation to the beach. We could have the wind onshore, so blowing down towards the shore. Just to make this clear, this is land. Um, onshore wind, we could have the wind coming from the side, or we could have the wind blowing off the land offshore. So, depending on the depth of the water here as well, if you firstly got this onshore wind, so the wind blowing down, which we can't even see, all right. So if the wind's blowing down, then if we would, this is new technology, by the way, magnetic boat. Um, if we come into the beach like this on a broad reach, then if the beach shallows, um, gets shallow kind of progressively, so you can stand a good few boat lengths away from the actual shoreline, what we can do is come in, turn the boat into the wind like that, jump off the boat, and if there's two of you, one of you can hold the boat at the front while the other drops the mainsail. That is by, uh, by far the easiest way to come in with an onshore wind. But that does rely on the nature of the bottom. Let's just draw, let's just draw a bit of the bottom in here. Um, where are we? About here. All right, so that's if it shelves gradually like that. But if it shelves steeply like, like that, then of course, you're not gonna be able to stand on the bottom, which means maybe we need to employ a different solution, which would be when we're quite a good distance away from the beach, but making sure we are definitely 
directly upwind of the beach. So all we have to do is sail downwind. Then we want to turn our boat into the wind up here. This is a long, a lot, this is not to scale by the way. We're gonna turn the boat into the wind up here. And then having turned the boat into the wind, what we'll do is drop the mainsail at that time. And then we can come back in just on the jib. And then of course, with just the jib, we can let that off completely as we get near to the beach. And then we can continue from there. So a lot easier if we can get the mainsail down out here, just come in under the jib. That would be the same method if you're coming in and there's waves on the beach. Um, so if there are waves, you don't want to be standing holding the boat in the waves, um, trying to drop the mainsail. So again, if there's waves and you don't want to run your boat up the beach, turn the boat into the wind out here, drop the sail, come in on the jib, easy. Um, easier said than done probably. And then if, uh, so let's change the wind direction. That's onshore wind, cross shore wind. So if the wind is, we once again, we can't see the wind. Okay, if the wind is in this direction, then what we want to do is to be approaching the beach on kind of like a close reach, close hauled point of sail. And this is by far the easiest time when it's going to be to come in. We come in towards the beach, sail's still up, and we just turn into the wind. Crew jumps off, grabs the front of the boat, um, make sure the rudders are up uh, as soon as possible because with the rudders, the worst thing you can possibly do is let your boat drift backwards and hit the bottom going backwards with the rudders. So that is a key consideration. Um, now you can get the mainsail down, take the boat up the beach. Or if you have got waves coming in, you could either drop the mainsail at sea, or what you could do, bring the boat in close to the beach, get the trolley under, and then bring the boat up at kind of 45 degrees there so that the boat's out of the water, turn it into the wind on the land and then drop the mainsail. So that's the easiest one if the wind is from the side. And then if the wind is offshore, all right. So if the wind is offshore, then what you could do is just sail in on an upwind point of sail. And then when you get to the beach, turn into the wind. This is in fact one of the easiest times to pull your boat out of the water, but you will have to sail upwind to get back to the beach. Just one thing with, if you are going to drop the mainsail, do be aware that the closest you'll be able to sail to the, be to the wind is a beam reach. So, in this offshore wind, you don't drop the mainsail out at sea in the offshore wind because you won't be able to sail close enough to the wind to get back to the beach. There we go. That is some landing strategies. Um, there we are. All right, just scrolling back. Okay, uh, yeah, I'll just, I'll just scoot over that one. Um, okay, Dave at Hobie 16 Amateur Hour says, the rap is on my channel. The channel's called Hobie 16 Amateur Hour. It's about a 10 minute video, most of the steps. Oh, he says, I'll send Joe pictures again. That sounds like he's already sent me pictures and somehow I, got, I lost them. So apologies if that is the case. All right, so coming on to another preloaded question. Uh, this one's from Sky Vector Aerial. When going for speed or flying a hull, we like this stuff, do you play the main sheet uncleated or cleat it and balance with the rudders? 
I think everybody who's been watching the videos for a while is going to know what the answer is going to be. But we're going to be, if we're going for speed, first, if we're going for speed, we're going to be playing the main sheet. Because um, by playing the main sheet, it means we've got much, much, much more control over the boat. And unless the wind is absolutely consistent, then um, if the wind isn't absolutely consistent, then the amount of steering you'll have to do to control the power on the boat is going to be massive. So the course is going to be like this. Whereas the way to go fast is to try to keep the course as straight as possible and play the main sheet. So main sheet out of the cleat for that. Um, and then for flying the hull, we're going to be using a, a combination of main sheet, rudders and adjusting our weight as well, depending on um, what the wind is doing. So the way we're going to use the main sheet is we're going to be pulling the main sheet in for more power, out for less power. Sounds pretty straightforward. And then with the steering, it does depend a bit on what point of sail we're on. But we're generally, if, if we are on a beam reach, if we are lower than the beam reach. So, in fact, let's, uh, we'll bring the board back into play. All right, here we are. So, if we've got a new wind. Okay, we've got a new wind coming from the top. This is our beam reach. So, That's our beam reach like that, or maybe we were going this way. If we're sailing lower downwind than the beam reach, then turn. let's consider the beam reach to be the most powered up point of sail in terms of flying the hull. So if we turn towards the beam reach, whether we're further up or further down, but if we turn towards this middle part, um, we're going to get more power. So if we're downwind, if we want the hull to lift a bit more, we're going to turn towards the wind. If we're upwind and we want the hull to lift a bit more, we're going to turn a little bit more downwind. But whenever we're using the rudders as a power control method, we're keeping any movements very small and very subtle um, because large movements really disturb, disturb the flow of water over the hulls and the rudders and it disturbs the flow of air over the sails. So we're trying to keep our flow as constant as possible by minimising the amount of rudder movement. So a lot of the time we're just going to be using the main sheet for our power control. There we go. That was a very good answer. All right, scrolling back a bit. I think we've got Oscar with um, people helping with the um, how big is your spinnaker shoot chat. Um, all right, German's fan. Is it a big problem if the ratcheting block of the main sheet doesn't ratchet anymore? The only problem with not having a ratchet on your main sheet block is it just makes it a lot more hard work um, sailing without a ratchet, uh, especially in, once you get to trapezing conditions, it becomes very hard work to sail without a ratchet on the main sheet block. If you haven't tried yet, if you think your ratchet's broken, just try giving your blocks a really good wash. So um, dunk them in some water, leave them overnight soaking, that kind of thing, then use the rope to really work the block. And there is a chance that your ratchet might come back to life. Um, but I'd say it's definitely worth having a ratchet on the main sheet. Makes it a lot easier. Okay. All right. Next preloaded question. Ah, so this is from David, who is looking for a reduced mainsail for his Hobie 16 
I quite like the look of the 14 Evo sale made by OS3. Um, but he's in the States. So firstly, has anybody experienced or has anybody got sales made by super sail makers, Riviera Beach, Florida? If you have, let us know what your experience was like, what the sales are like. And if you like them, whether you'd recommend them. I've looked on the website and it certainly looks like a great place to check out if you are looking for new custom sales, um, especially if you're in Florida, which I know a lot of you are. Um, that's the first one. Um, do I need to install another block hanger on my 16 boom? Um, or do I need a Hobie 14 boom? You wouldn't need a 14 boom. You'd be able to put the 14 sail onto the 16 boom. But I think where we are now with David is he's looking at getting a main sail made by super sail makers, which has actually got a much better reefing system than the original Hobie sail. Um, but the original boom will be fine. And in theory, where the block hanger is should be absolutely fine. That that shouldn't be any different, I think. All right. And then there's the question of, he hasn't got the reefing stopper on the main halyard. And he asked, can you kind of retrofit the second stopper to a main halyard? The answer is no. But if you're, I'm pretty sure even in America, all boats from the last 15 years or so, the main halyards would have the second stopper for the reefing point. So if your main halyard is older than that, then chances are it's been around for some time and it's probably about time to get a new one anyway. So let's get a new one and um, then we can crack on from there. All right, so there we go. All right, no further questions, please, at this time. Um, I'll just answer the. I'll just answer the remainder of the comments that we've got here, live. Hi Matthew, great to have you on board. Okay. Oh, Dave actually had somebody tell him to turn his ratchet off during um, a race because of the noise gave away the tactics to competitors. A ratchet is pretty noisy, but you do get addicted to those uh, clicking noises. All right. So we've got Alfro, Al, all from Canmore, lifespan of sales under normal usage and proper storage. I would say um, for a main sale, I'd say you should, depends on the type of boat to a certain degree. But I think, like, if we're talking Hobie 16, which, of course, we talk a lot about here, we, you'd be looking at 10 years, maybe more, 15 years out of a mainsail, um, as, as long as you wash it after you go sailing or if you sail on fresh water. Yeah, Hobie 16, all right, good guess. Um, yeah, from a new sail, 15 years, if you wash it regularly, um, perhaps lubricate the bolt rope, before you hoist the sail. Uh, as I've said before, the best lubrication I've found is water, fresh water. Just hose that bad boy down before you pull it up. It means you're not gonna get that friction, which is eventually gonna wear the bolt rope, especially at the battens. So that's worth doing. And then if you make sure it's dry and you put it back in the bag after you finish sailing and don't store it in anywhere with a lot of heat, then I'd say the mainsail could last as much as 15 years um, and still be in pretty good shape. The jib, however, has got a little bit more of a, gets more wear and tear on the jib. The jib's the sail that's going to flap more, it's going to hit the mast, and I'd say six or seven years tops for a jib. Um, and if you want to race, then you'd probably be looking at if you want to race at a high level, you'd probably want to be replacing your jib maybe every three or four years, I would say. 
There we go. All right, so back on to the preloaded questions. Yeah, no further live questions, please, now, as we have exceeded our one hour scheduled time. The next one, this is a topic that we like. We've got Simon in Australia. Simon is actually from Sweden, but he's living in Australia. He's got an F-16 Viper from Goodall Design. Um, he says, I'm struggling like hell to bearing away at the top mark with my Viper in hard wind, strong wind. Um, he nose dives two out of four times, fun times. All right, so some steps that can be taken during the high wind bear away is the first one is you want to over dump. So what I mean by over dump is to release more sail than you're probably going to have to. And that means that as you bear away, the sail's not going to catch more wind like halfway around the turn, forcing the bows down. So before you even look at the bear away, let the traveller out. If you're concerned about the pitch pole, let your traveller out all of the way, all the way out and let out some main sheet as well. Okay, so that's stage one. Um, stage two would be to pick a good spot to bear away in if you have the choice. A bit of flatter water would be nice. Um, ask... American magic how to bear away at the top mark. Whoa. Um, yeah, um, yeah, a bit of flat water would be nice. But um, And then when you're ready to go for the bear away, just make sure your weight is as far back on the boat as possible. If you're granted Simon's on a, a Viper, which doesn't have a massive jib, but to make this applicable to everyone, if you are sailing a boat with a big jib, the one that springs to mind would be the Hobie 20 or the Hobie 18 Classic. Um, ease the jib off as well before you bear away. And then as uh, get as far back as possible on the boat before you bear away. And then as you bear away, just let out main sheet. And the amount of main sheet to let out is if at any point the bow starts to dip at all. So if you've got your weight back first, the bow should be up a little bit. So as you bear away, if that bow starts to come down, let out some more main sheet. As it, if it starts to come down, let out a bit more. And that way, you should be able to avoid the problem with the bows going in. And then what we're trying to do is get through, like we said before, the beam reach is the most powered up point of sail. So as we turn more downwind from the beam reach, it should be starting to... Uh, take that nose diving tendency out a little bit. So then we, once we're on our new course, we can start to sheet in again, maybe bring the traveller back in. On the Viper, we're going to want to be putting up the spinnaker. So we want to get the traveller into the middle if it's strong wind, main sheet crank back in, but not until we've got the wind coming from behind us. That's a good answer. Thank you. Okay, Frank in Canada. Frank with the Prindle 15 flying free says, is it advantageous to have a furling Genoa in addition to a furling jib? Um, you'd only, of course, be able to have one of them up at a time, but the furling Genoa would be a great choice. A Genoa is basically halfway between a jib and uh, asymmetric spinnaker or Genica or Genica. Um, so it's like a really big jib, which is going to really give you a lot of power, mostly beneficial for the reaches, uh, whatever sort of reach you're sailing on. So I'd say, yes, it would be beneficial. But if you're going to ask, so is it worth me changing my regular jib for a Genoa? Then um, if you could get hold of a Genoa for not much money, try it out because you'd have to get one made or you'd have to just get lucky with the dimensions of the sail because as far as I know, Prindle don't offer a standard Hobie uh, Prindle 15 Genoa. So that's a consideration as well. But it would be very interesting to try to see what the performance 
is like uh, off the wind with the bigger jib. Uh, the bigger jib will give you the most boat speed um, on the beam reach or the broad reach. And if you put a bigger jib on the boat, then, oh, how do you write Genoa? It is G E N O A. Genoa. Um, yeah, it's like a big jib. Most famously used on the Flying Dutchman uh, monohull, of course. So there we go. Um, all right, we're getting there. I've just got a few more. Hope everyone's having a lovely time. Um, we've got Brett. What is the difference between a downhaul and a Cunningham on the mainsail of a cat? Now, this is going to blow your mind. There's no difference at all. It's all just words. Um, depends on the background of where people have come from, what sort of sailing they're from, perhaps who taught them to sail. People use different words. But traditionally, from the UK, the down, it was always called the downhaul on a catamaran, uh, the Cunningham on a monohull, for some reason. Um, there we go. All right, we've got a question from Craig. Who says... I have trouble when close hauled sailing to get the mainsail windward telltale. <laughs> um, I'm just reading Dave's comment there. Um, to get the windward telltale to fly straight. The jib telltales fly parallel, but the main windward telltale just flies straight up, but can't get it going back even when block to block. Okay, so. Um, I'll just draw a quick illustration of what Craig's talking about. Um, so we've got the two telltales. This dotted line is the one that we can see through the mainsail and the straight line is the one on the windward side. And as we know, optimal is to have both telltales flying straight back. But what Craig's saying is no matter what he does when sailing upwind, um, when sailing upwind, he can't get this inside telltale to fly straight back. Now, so which would mean it would be kind of up here somewhere. Firstly, I'd say this is the same for absolutely everyone. Once you get to trapezing conditions, it's not actually possible to sheet the mainsail in enough to get um, that inside telltale flying straight back. Um, if you had a lot more weight on the boat, the problem is when you sheet in, then uh, you get overpowered. Or if you're not overpowered, you have to point the boat higher into the wind, which will put that telltale up again. So, um, Generally speaking, no, it's not possible to get that telltale flying straight back. Um, as long as you've got the main, for, for your boat speed, as long as you've got the mainsail as much in as you possibly can um, for that amount of wind, and you don't have the feeling that you're stalling, stalling you'd feel by the rudders getting very heavy and every time you try to pull the rudders towards you a bit, you feel like they're not gripping that means you've got too much mainsail in, as well as perhaps your hull is like right up in the air. So then you need to let the mainsail out, perhaps travel her out a little bit, bring the main sheet back in. But it's unlikely in trapezing conditions that you'd ever be able to get that inside telltale flying. All right, final question for today is from Bruce. And Bruce says, this is one that you might not have considered. Why do the jaws of the main sheet block face downwards, whereas on every other dinghy that uh, Bruce is aware of, which uh, I think we'll all agree, um, the cleat jaws face upwards? Well, interesting question. Does every, I'm hoping that everybody can visualise down so the rope comes out like that. On a monohull, it's generally up. This is just because 
of where the pull is generally coming from. On a catamaran, um, you're mostly pulling more flat with the boat, um, which means if the cleat was up, you'd have a lot more of a hard time uncleating the mainsail. Um, whereas on a monohull, you're usually sat on the edge and maybe the cleat is lower than you, which means you want the cleat to be on top so that you can uncleat it and have the option to cleat it. Um, it's just because a catamaran, you're sitting flat, whereas a monohull, you're sitting higher up than where the main sheet cleat is. That is my explanation of that one. All right, so there we go. All right, one last question. This is from Guy. In your videos, you know how to predict when a gust is coming. How do you know? What you're looking for is um, you're looking on the water at all times when you're sailing and you're looking towards the direction that the wind is coming from. And what you're looking for on the water is something different. Um, the usual differences which would indicate a gust would be maybe a darker patch of water. Or if you're in a sunny place like this, it might be a shinier uh, patch of water, which would be a gust coming. Because as the gust is passing over the water, it's making that bit of water rougher. So that is what we're looking for, the darker patch. Back in the day, people used to swear by wearing polarised sunglasses because it was easier to see the gusts. You can take that or leave it. But um, yeah, that is how I would suggest spotting for gusts. But the gusts that are going to influence you will be coming from the direction that the wind is coming from. Except on a downwind course, <laughs> or look for Dave's capsized boat, of course, there we go, that's gonna help as well. Or if you're on a downwind course in heavy wind, the gust that's gonna hit you will be slightly further forwards because you're sailing fast. So the gust that's actually from the direction of the wind, you're leaving that one behind. You're gonna get the one which is further up. There we go. So I'm gonna leave it there, if I may, uh, for today. Thanks very much to everybody for tuning in. Oh, hello. Stephen says, it's a bit late. Okay, if you're gonna... Oh, thanks for the advice on the Nacra Dagger board a couple of weeks ago. Okay, so um, you're welcome, no problem. Um, yeah, so thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to hit the like button before you leave. Um, and I'll be back on Sunday with Show Us Your Cat. Um, we have, I did put out a post on the YouTube community tab to find out where it, I know a lot of people have already told me where they're sailing from, show us your cat, but I was just gonna, being a bit lazy, to be honest, I just wanted to not have to go through um, a thousand emails. But um, if um, you could let me know where it is you sail and I've actually written down, um, have I? No, I haven't. Um, okay, yeah, where you sail, what the facilities are like, where you sail, and how suitable it would be for somebody to come to where you sail with their boat. Will they have a good time? Is it good sailing there? Do other people sail there? That kind of thing. So that what we could put together is a kind of spot guide around the world. Um, so that if somebody wants to go somewhere with their boat, Perhaps is there the opportunity to sail where you sail if they don't have a boat, that kind of thing. Um, this could actually turn out to be quite a massive project that someone else has probably already done, but that's what we're here for. Okay, thanks very much. See you next week with some more of this. If not, we'll see you before with some more of the other. Thank you.